Welcome everyone that's uh, joined and more starting to join at the moment. Uh, great to have you all here with us for our little session that we have got with Alex. Um, and obviously a, a big exciting day as Kiermont's released their single vineyard wines uh, today and yesterday in the Cape. So lots of excitement in the air, which we'll, we'll obviously chat about as we taste through them and talk through them. And yeah, so this is the first sort of uh, solo taste and that we're doing with Alex, which is awesome. So Alex, thanks for your time. I will we'll let you roll away with it or just take it away just now. Um, and yeah, we've been working with uh, Kiermon for a few years now. Um, and there's lots of awesome sort of links with um, Great Domains and Kiermont and Alex and the wines and where people that have worked here have worked. So I was at school with Alex. Um, he wasn't a winemaker when we were at school, but obviously people choose different paths once they leave. And um, and then fast forward however many years later, probably way more years than we'd like to talk about. We're sitting here and Alex is making some of the best wines in the country um, in Stellenbosch. And uh, just great to have the wines up in Joburg and, um, and work with them. So um, what we'll do is, I mean, everyone's familiar with the format here, but obviously we always encourage everyone to, to engage where possible, pop some questions on the chat, and I'll just uh, manage it wherever possible to interrupt Alex and deal with some of the questions, which is always some of the value that you can extract from these sessions. And um, I think the, yeah, the best way to go about this, I think Alex, you, I know you, you've, you've done a few tastings today, but it'd be great just to maybe give everyone a, uh, a short overview of sort of, I mentioned school, but literally from finishing school to where you're sitting now, sort of that path and where the, where you've been and worked. And then maybe just after that intro, I don't think anyone knows, but we've got a, a special guest uh, joining us, which we'll rope him in just after your, after your intro. Um, and he's a neighbor of yours. I'm sure many of you that have joined us know David Trafford. And there's a lot of uh, obviously relevant links with the two of you, but we'll bring them up just after your your intro and then have a have a chat. So welcome and yeah, thanks very much for your time. Good to have you. Cool, thanks, Derek. Lovely. Uh, thank you very much for putting this thing together. It's it's uh, the new format of of getting your message out to people. You can't go to big wine shows anymore. So really nice to sort of uh, engage with people on another on another media. So thank you. Cool. Do you want me to? Should I? Should I fire away with with uh, the, my long my long history? Yeah, I mean, I just I think just a very short synopsis, and then we'll obviously we'll we'll get to the end point, which is you sitting in the chair at Kiermont there. But I mean, from 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 sort of school you left, and how did the winemaking thing happen? Did you? Yeah, have a sort of a passion. Um, how did I think happen? I think the winemaking thing. Often people ask you like, why why when when did you first decide to be a winemaker? And and for me, it's actually it probably it was a very subtle sort of long-term thing which built up. I, I grew up on a farm which is very close to Kiermont. Uh, we we had a number of different types of agriculture from a dairy, uh, piggery at one stage, and then lots of deciduous fruit, citrus fruit, and then and then lots of vineyards as well. And um, I used to always, you know, whether it was the milk. That we that we took on the bucky and we used to take it down to the local dairy and hand it into the dairy, or um, if we uh, if if we were picking fruit, we used to take it to the packing shed, and obviously with the grapes, we used to take it to the winery, um, and we used to go down to what used to be called the Kleinazalza Co-op, I think it was, which is now Dazalza or Kleinazalza, and then. Um, after that, and, and also to Friesenhof and to various other wineries. And so sort of fell in love with this uh, process of, of, of making grape juice and making wine. My dad uh, is, is obviously loves his wine and always used to share with me a glass, you know, even when I was a lighty, he used to say, okay, well, this is the Tolana Hill Chardonnay or this is the Plain as also Sauvignon Blanc or whatever it was. I didn't like the reds that much, but the whites were, were, were nice. So I started to, to gain this relationship between the vineyard and the and the winery, um, which which you know is a, a very natural thing as you're growing up. But then decided now I wanted to be like I remember some of my career choices were like I wanted to be a dolphin trainer at one stage. <laughs> that was definitely training dolphins was right up there because I went to the aquarium and 
Um, and then I thought about sports physio and various other things. And, and one day I was on the farm. Um, it, I remember it quite clearly thinking I was at home. It was quite, quite late and I was sitting outside and I was thinking, you know, I want to live on a farm one day. It, it, farming became something which I knew I wanted. To do. I didn't want to be out in the savannah somewhere. I wanted to be on a farm. And I heard about this course that you could do at Stellenbosch University where you did viticulture and, and onology, winemaking. And I thought that that sounds like a good thing to do. Um, and basically, straight after school, went overseas for a year, lived in the UK for a year, and then came back and studied, started studying viticulture and onology, which was, to be honest, the, the BSc at, at DK, I think we shared some, some classes. And I think, I don't know about you, but I was definitely at the stretching point of my, my pea-sized brains computing. Um, yeah, just driving, just you just wanted to see a five and a zero, and then just realize, <laughs> yeah, yeah done. exactly. So, it, so you could go on holiday. Um, yeah, so so it was really tough, and initially in the first few years with all the chemistry and the physics was really tough. But we started to taste wines and get into the wine thing, you know. And that the moment that you start falling in love with that wine culture, that that bit of history and tasting wines and stuff. It, it starts pulling you through that course, you know, where, where even though the science is maybe a bit boring, you know, eventually you're going to be in a cellar one day making, making wines. Yeah. Um, in that, in my fourth year, I did a prac at Le Ormerons, which was a, a really big harvest at that stage. And Tony Rupert had just died and they, um, had, they decided to do a really massive harvest. And we, we put a, you know, that was really pruning, but it was fun. You know, like it was long hours and, uh, and I just really loved that challenge. And then straight after, after that, I went over, uh, after I graduated, went over to Chile. Uh, I worked in Chile for about four months or so. A big seller over there called Vinya Tarapaka um, ran the night shift, which is the worst thing on earth to do. Run it, you never want to work at night. It's just horrible. Um, yeah. And uh, we, we processed, I think, 12,000 tons through the cellar. It was like constant grape, grapes coming in. Um, I think I realized after a while that that was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then I went over to Spain and I, and I hitchhiked around Spain looking for work and ended up in a, uh, also a cooperative cellar. Um, and while I was working, and we were making base wine for Carver, actually, very close to Barcelona. Okay. Um, so what's the, you know, when, you, when you're making base wine for Carver, you're basically trying to make the most neutral wine possible. Yeah. So you're not learning a lot about winemaking. Um, and uh, so when I left there, uh, or no, while, while I was there, um, Chris Mullineau was working, obviously being Chris working in somewhere much more glamorous, somewhere, I think he was in, in uh, uh, Burgundy or somewhere. But he said he was coming down with a mate, Pascal Schultz, and, and can they pick me up on their way? They're going to the free rut. And so we, we spent a weekend up in the free rut with, with Irvin and Irvin's partner up there and, and, and visited some other wineries. And that really opened my eyes and, and we tasted some lovely burgundies that they brought with us, with them and that sort of thing. And it really opened my eyes to these little wineries, like really focusing on a, uh, a parcel of fruit and, and doing something unique with it. Um, and then came back to South Africa and, and, and applied for two jobs. One was in Hermanus um, and the other one was here in Stellenbosch. I, I chased, I see Dave Trafford's come online. I chased Dave Trafford on. I remember I walked up to his house and if you've ever walked up to Dave's house, you know, it's quite a, it's quite a steep walk. And I dropped my CV off and he was like, oh, thanks very much, but we don't take interns. <laughs> and I was like, oh, he's very, very bleak. Um, and walked back down the hill, and I think I think my walking up the hill impressed Dave because he called me back and he said, "You know what? Actually, we could use you." Um, so, so I, I, I very fortunately moved onto the Trafford. Uh, I think in about a December, two thousand and three. Um, Dave needed some help with the, with uh, checking on the vineyards and checking the ripeness of the grapes. I think we were bottling as well at the time. Um, so, so I just sort of fell into the run there and then obviously stayed for the harvest and, and then a month or so after harvest just to make sure everything was pressed and, you know, I think, I think we did in that vintage, uh, 
Dave, I think we did the, the biggest vintage you've done, which was about 90 tons or something, all through Dave's little cellar with only one little basket press. So we really built some serious muscles. Now, I was going to say, yeah. so on that note, I mean, this is obviously a one-sided story. I think we need to, we need to bring Dave onto, onto the screen just so he can talk us through the regrets that he had for those four months of bringing you on board. I think we need to get the <laughs> Dave, how are you doing? <clears throat> yeah, hi, Derek. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. <laughs> no, it's not yeah, great, great, to, great to see you, yeah. man. And I think it made, yeah. made total sense, the two, the two neighbors. Yeah. Uh, oh, so I didn't, I, before it's, this, uh, I wasn't aware that Alex uh, knocked, knocked on your door. I'd sort of, that, that bit of info I'd missed out. So that must have been quite, quite a laugh. Well, it's, it's nice having nice neighbors. <laughs> Especially, yeah, when, when, uh, when they're not yeah. eating your chickens, huh? Yeah, oh, you heard that story. Okay. <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, I wasn't so keen on interns. I had, um, I had Chris Mullenew work for me in 2001, and that put me off interns for <laughs> life. So, no, Just it was, lazy, uh, no work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> no, he was a great intern, and Alex, too. Yeah, so, yeah, it's been a really nice relationship, and... Um, yeah, it was good having Alex. I think um, I think he's still the only guy who's fallen in a tank um, during a harvest. Although actually, I did fall fall in myself a couple of years ago. Sort <laughs> of half. I kind of landed on the plank that goes across the 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 couf, the the fermentation tank. So I sort of two two thousand and four syrup, eh? Uh, something like that. That's quite <laughs> Got that extra sweaty saddle sort of aroma. <laughs> yeah. And and Dave, did so. you um did you know Mark at all before sort of he bought the farm and all that, or was that just he was then no. then and that's how it all started, and then he started selling you some grapes and all that. Well, I know, well no, I didn't know Mark before that, but uh, it had actually started before that. Um, well, half of the Kiermon farm my parents actually owned, and um, we couldn't grow grapes because of the quota restrictions. So my parents grew rootstock on the most kind of arable land. And that was a hell of a boring business. It's basically just growing sticks for the nursery industry. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think my dad, you know, it was a like retirement sort of job. And uh, yeah, he just kind of realized farming wasn't for him and, and it wasn't the greatest type of farming. So we sold that part of the farm off, about 85 hectares, uh, to the neighbors at the time, who were the Arnolds. And um, then, yeah, then, then we had basically just 200 hectares, but um, developed our little vineyard uh, subsequently. And then... Um, yeah, with the Arnolds, we started making a little, well, we started buying a bit of fruit and we also made a couple of vintages for them, um, 2000 and 2001 and 2002. And then, uh, yeah, I think Mark bought in 2003. So, so we kind of continued okay. what we'd started. And then, yeah, there was a big uh, replanting, well, basically planting new vineyards and some replanting and um, yeah so a, a, a big a big kind of investment in the property which was which was really lacking so yeah it's a whole range of most beautiful vineyards so, and and Dave I'm lucky so obviously all the grapes that <laughs> all, all the all the grapes you're getting from from Alex next door how much sort of I don't know, collaboration is there, or do you just leave it sort of, you need, you, they know, the guys know what to do, or do you sort of work sort of hand in hand for those grapes that you're getting, or what's the arrangement? I need a lot of guidance. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, in the beginning, I was a bit of a mother hen, but um, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, they've, they've got it really sussed, the vineyards are really beautifully managed, and um, yeah, it's just, just a case of sort of chatting quite regularly and looking at the vineyards quite regularly more because it's like a nice thing to do rather than to sort of like hey what's happening here sort of thing so so no it's a great uh, great relationship and um yeah we're very lucky to have have uh, you know 
great neighbors that we can neighbors. work with. <laughs> no, well, it's as I say, we, I know that you, you've got to head off somewhere, but it was just, as I say, totally yeah. really to try and bring you up because I think, as Alex was saying to me, I mean, without um, your relationship with him, uh, you wouldn't have potentially got the job with Mark at Kiermont and, and sort of and now is carving out this um, enviable reputation next to you with, with these amazing wines. So there's a strong link and it's, yeah, so it's very yeah. cool. No, the wines are, are really great. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Dave, thanks, man. We, we're right. going to be picking Alex's brain and we just, yeah, thanks so much for your time and for, for logging on. We'll, we'll see you down, hopefully, on the farm down the Cape sometime soon. And yeah, come pop in. <laughs> yeah, it will be great. And uh, actually, I, I really want to come and visit your, your spot in Malchas. That's, that's on my bucket oh. list. Um, yeah, that's a proper drive. Uh, yeah. Catch a cob in the Breda River and um, and drink some wine, something like that. Exactly. <laughs> no, great okay. stuff, Dave. Thanks a lot. Right, thanks a lot. Okay, cheers, Alex. Cheers, Dave. <laughs> okay, bye, bye. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, Derek, when, when Dave logs off now, we can tell my side of the story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, we're no, ask Christopher to quickly, quickly mute him. But no, I, I didn't. Yeah. Know he, the, the the very simply, we said, oh, it makes sense. Next door neighbors, let's bring him on. But actually, the the link and the history and the relevance is actually a lot more, um, lots sort of stronger than I thought. So very cool. And he's such a and he's such a nice guy. So it's um, he's, a, he's an awesome guy to have as a neighbor. And um, you know, even if even if we didn't supply grapes or we didn't have this history, like. To have somebody with all that experience um, as a neighbor, as a winemaker, he's he's got his own style. He likes to do things his way, um, and that's admirable. And and often I will, you know, as a young winemaker, and I'm getting I'm not such a young winemaker anymore, but um, you, I was quite concerned about certain big decisions that needed to be made, or even if it was a small decision, I would be stressed about whether I blended certain things together or what sort of wine to make. To have somebody with like Dave, who is such a level-headed person and 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 so sort of uh, with so much experience, I could call him up and say, "Listen, what what do you think?" His suggestion would always be completely left field from what, yeah. what I'd, I and I'd be like, "Why didn't I think of that?" You know, like he yeah. just he has this way of just just calculating things well. So a great name. Think- yeah, as you say, to have that sounding block next next door is actually a privilege because lots of people wouldn't have that. So I think that's that's absolutely, a absolutely huge benefit. Yeah. Um, so Alex, yeah, you've taken us basically up until that point where I mean we've basically said the handover, pretty much that bit of time at the Trafford, and then you obviously met Mark Rafe, who um, him and his wife Monica own Kiermont, and and obviously. Um, developed a sort of a, a relationship with you to bring you on board to basically drive this whole project um and um yeah so that how, how's sort of that all come about and i think maybe just a bit a bit of bit about mark and the farm and then i think we're looking at one of the vineyards that's going into terrassa i think and if it is then maybe and then just go go from there into the first one i need to figure out what we're looking at because i'm looking at myself at the moment okay there we go <laughs> Um, okay, so let me let me start off with uh, with with Mark. Um, so Mark came down from Joburg and he had bought this beautiful farm. They used to own a, a tobacco production facility up there, which was called Dingler Tobacco, and they used to make boxer tobacco, which is that little orange packet with the two boxes slogging it out. Um, and they sold the whole the whole factory up there, the whole company, and they moved down to the Cape. And he bought the farm as a place to raise his children and uh, he, you know, and, and always loved agriculture. I think they had a little bit of a history with uh, up in the near Nelspray there, they had another farm up there. And um, he decided that he wanted to uh, plant some grapes on the farm. And so I had been working at De Trafford when I, I went back overseas and I left a CB for him. Uh, I'd gone to go and do another vintage in Spain. And I said, listen, I'm over, you know, I'm going overseas, uh, but I'm really interested. If you ever do anything on the farm, I'd love to apply. And fortunately, he, he you know, we had chatted and he, had, he knew me. He checked out my references and he said, okay, well, I want to, you know, plant more vineyards. And um, so could you come back and help us do that? So 
when, when I got back, we, we chatted about it. He gave me a little laborer's cottage on the farm, which was like my first own house, which was really awesome. Um, and I started planting vineyards for him. It afforded me the time to do another vintage at De Trafford uh, in the cellar and then do two vintages abroad, one in Cote Rotti and one in uh, Saint Emilion um, at, at two really good producers and, and learned a lot there. Um, and in the meantime, started to make a little bit of wine uh, in the Kiermont cellar as well. So we're really focusing much more on the, on the vineyards and getting the vineyards established properly. But then there's also, you know, the side of it where we, where we went out and, and made a little bit of wine, a couple of barrels of wine. And that ended up tasting pretty good. And Mark got more excited about the winemaking. And then we went, you know, we decided to put a label on one of them and, and we got into making wine. Alex, tell me, so that I think one thing I'm interested, the planting thing, which you obviously um, involved in from the beginning, how much of a blank canvas was that for you versus what, let's say, Mark wanted was, I mean, I always, and this is, I know this isn't what happened, but you know what I mean, where you have, you can go to Himmel and Arden now, and there's um, a chap who's bought a farm, I was speaking to Hannah Storm, it wasn't his farm, but next door, and some guys planted 50 hectares of Merlot, and Hannes is just looking like going, why is the guy planted Merlot? Just plant some Chardonnay and Pinot, but then it's too late. So like how, how, how much- Merlot, DK, Merlot is the new Grenache, really. Merlot <laughs> is like, it, it's well, taking over the world. No, yeah, I, was, so, I was going on yeah. Hannes's reaction that it probably wasn't the best call, but anyway. Um, no, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And it's a huge call, you know, it really is a massive decision that of, of what you're gonna do. Sorry, I'm just, I'm on my phone. So I'm just trying to figure out the, the logistics here. So um, it really is a big call. I arrived on the farm and all of my energy really was put into deciding what to plant where. We had been, uh, Mark had gone the year before and actually got a, one of these companies who come and do a terroir analysis of the farm, which was very handy. Um, and I'm not being sarcastic. It really was. Um, it, mm. it, you know, it gave you light intensity of all the vineyards or, or all the planting sites that we wanted to plant. Um, you know, aspect, uh, how cool they were, how warm they were, type of soil, all those sorts of things. And um, I used that to a great extent in deciding what to plant where, and then I and I overruled some of their suggestions. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, so, now, but, uh, so now you got to be honest. What was the worst suggested call that they made? Well, when we started, we there, there was some vineyards, vineyard um, uh, material already ordered. So the 2005 planting uh, was was very much the um, you know was already ordered. So I didn't have too much freedom. I think I might have changed something slightly, but. We, we put in a bit of petty Bordeaux, and I don't think that that's a great cultivar for this area. Um, okay. it's, it's, it, I've really struggled with the block because it's very susceptible to wind damage. So anytime okay. the wind blows, all the shoots break off. Um, and that's really been the only one. And where it's more sheltered, the wine is really lovely. So it actually, it, it's a nice cultivar to have on the farm. But yeah, yeah. in general, their, their advice wasn't bad, you know. Um, but I always need to, to explain to people, we planted at that time, I think 11 different varieties on the farm. Um, and the idea was still, I, ad, admittedly, I probably did have some dreams of one day using all of those in making wine, but a lot of the, th the thinking was behind, we need to sell grapes. So okay. what's selling in the area? Cabernet is okay. selling, Shiraz is selling, Shannon is selling, you know those sorts of things. So, so a lot of it was based on on what we what we knew we could sell, um, but that was obviously what was working, and therefore it's worked in our minds as well. Yeah, and I think those the, that that roll call of names of grapes that you've listed anyway. That's those are sort of you probably you wouldn't change much of the, that anyway in terms of where the farm is and, and the wines that you've been making from those varieties on those soils. So. Um, I, I always just I think, a, yeah yeah I think now now that we are a little bit more established and we're starting to sell wine and we see what's working and what's not what's selling you know then you, then you would look at the planting a little bit differently then you start looking at it and what do we need and you know then you start 
maybe planting something which, which you have more demand for. But at that time, it was purely based on what would work you know, on, on particular sites, which is good. Oh, that's awesome. So um, it's probably worth getting, we've got a, it's, we're going to go shoot through the sort of the range of the wines, including the latest uh, releases. So I think the first one we would obviously be, it's in fact, the one that we're drinking now or that I'm drinking is the Terrassa 17. And I yes. think this picture in the background, if you can see it, is one of the vineyards. I, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I've just spotted in the top right hand corner is actually the, the fowl eater, the guinea, the, the David's chicken eater. <laughs> That's Milo up there. Uh, actually, so, so oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's well hidden, but he's there. Um yeah. so, so, <laughs> so yeah, so we're looking at a block here. The, this picture um is a block called Terrassa. Um, and it was where we got the name for the wine. But at that stage, it was really, really young, and we were only thinking about including it at a later stage. This is a block of Chardonnay, which is planted uh, bush vine, and it's interestingly planted. It's it's quite a south-facing slope, and it's old terraces which were which were already existing under the fainbos that obviously had been covered up over the years. And when we when we, when I went walking there, then I found these terraces, and we cleared the fainbos and we planted the vineyards. On these old terraces so it has to be worked by hand 100 percent. you can't get a tractor in there or any implement so everything we do there is it's we spray it by hand um and uh and and work it by hand we're busy mowing it with a weed eater at the moment so it's one of the blocks which goes into our terrassa white blend um the you know all of the blocks are planted as as terraces going up the mountain um the terrassa blend the basis for the wine is generally Chenin Blanc, um, a little bit of Chardonnay and a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. And then we use um, Viognier first, and then more recently Marsan and Roussan as little blending components, which we blend in at about five or six percent each. So and maybe how, a barrel or two each. And how much would the Chenin generally make up? Like 30, 40 percent or more? Yeah, I like the Shannon to be around the 50% mark, eh? okay. at least. Yeah, yeah. I like, I, I love the Shannon in this valley, and I think it, it really is the, the you know, the, the go-to grape. You know, the yeah. other things, the other things bring bring certain elements, and it's quite funny because the the, the Shannon covers a lot of bases. You know, it's such an all-round grape. It can give yeah. you acidity. It can give you uh, fullness on the palate. It, you know, all it can give you fruit and spice and all those things, but. We now bring in all of those other cultivars, like the Sauvignon Blanc is from a, a really old uh, dryland block, uh, and it, it, it's beautiful sort of tropical fruit Sauvignon Blanc, but with, with amazing freshness, and that really brings the freshness to the terrassa. Is, is yeah. that Sauvignon Vineyard the same vineyard where you where you've sort of on occasion sold a tiny bit of it to to our friend Peter Valser? Is that the same block? Uh, Peter doesn't buy any grapes from us. That's ah, all under so. yeah, no. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> Peter does. Yeah, he buys. We've, we've, he's, he's actually my favorite grape customer, uh, other than Dave, of course. Uh, um, but Peter, you know, with, Pete, with the exciting thing about working with Peter is I can say, look, we've, we've picked this block and there's still a ton of grapes there. Do you want it? And he's always keen to try something. So he, he will always pick up, he's, he takes certain blocks on a regular basis, but he's always keen to pick up the little bits and pieces that are left over. So, yeah. so that really suits us down onto the ground. Yeah, so, yeah, you, so you're, one of, you're one of the reasons why a next vintage comes and Peter's not making 50 wines anymore, he's making like 59 wines. And then we've got to yeah. get the story and yeah. Exactly. Uh, my, my favorite one of Peter's is called Yarbrew. Um, because whenever he, whenever he phones me, I'm always like, yeah, bro, how's it going? <laughs> um, and, and so he, he buys Malbec from us and he calls it yeah, bro. I didn't actually know that one. That's, that's, yeah. you can't keep up to speed with all of his stories. But back to the test. So, so I'm, I've just actually finished the last drop. I must get the guys from upstairs to try and uh, top me up. Um, the wine's amazing. I like, it's just... I think this wine totally over delivers in my like from my personal point of view um it over delivers it's a proper glass of wine it's and it's and it's solid value like if you think about what it's what it sells for i mean yes it's not a, a inexpensive bottle of wine but it's not like a 
expensive bottle of wine. If you know, it's it's really well placed, and I think like totally over delivers without sounding like a like a smos. It's really a cracking bottle of wine, and 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 you sort of don't. It's it's intriguing with all the varieties in, but I, I think the blending part is made. Yeah, my my glass is getting full. Um, Fantastic! I love it when that happens. Um, the no, you think of Viognier and Marsan, and I almost start to stress. I sort of oh, what's that going to do to the wine? But I think having that fifty percent base of Shannon is just so solid, and all those little aspects that get added probably add these little nuances, but they don't overpower it or anything. You've got that that Shannon base, which I think is the the right calling card, as you say. So anyway, delicious. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the blending is really. You know, you, you're creating complexity there. You, 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 you're filling in all the little gaps and, and, and bringing more to the wine. I'm a, I'm a terrible cook, but I love cooking. And I'm the same if I'm making like a pasta sauce or something. I'll go and scratch through the pantry and take out any spices and throw them all <laughs> together and see what they do. And as long as you can keep them within a balance, you know, that, they, yeah. that one of them doesn't throw that balance out, then, then you actually end up with this delicious meal that's just complex, you know. It's the same with oh, the wine. No, it's uh, no, it's a it's a beaut. I, th I think we're gonna. I don't know if this is a pick. Is this the 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 next one, the Riverside? So, so it's quite yeah, it's quite apt to go onto this photo now. This is a, a one of our old vines. Um, I'm actually currently myself making my way through. Uh, this is this is called uh, Riverside Shannon Blanc, um, and um, this is one of our our old vines. It was planted in 1971. Um, it's uh, a, a beautiful old vineyard, uh, really, really actually taking quite a bit of strain now, losing quite a few vines, but the wine that it produces every year is so unique and, and intense that we've, that we hang on to the vineyard, even though we've got such low yields from it. So it was a very important block when I started the farm. It is an sort of an anchor block for us. It started the terrassa. Um, and now as our younger plantings of Shannon have come online, they've sort of taken over that role in the terrassa and, and, the, and the, the grapes from this vineyard now go into the riverside Shannon. Yeah, you, and you, I think you mentioned today when we, had, when we chatted that, um, and you've just said it now, that the, like the viability of this block is it's under a bit of pressure in terms of whatever, what the future is and the health of the vines. I mean... I know that you say it relatively cryptically. I'm not sure if it's deliberate, but like, is it, do you sort of see this vineyard not existing in the next five years or are you doing sort of selected replanting or what's the sort of vibe? It's, it's unfortunately, we looked at it very closely and it's, it's beyond the point of repair. It's beyond the point of, of putting in, you know, trying to plug the holes in it. Um, so it's, it's a matter of how long we can hang on to it. You know, it's it's unfortunately every year another couple of vines. I mean, it's great for Brywood when every like every year a couple of vines die. But um, you know, it's really to send a tractor through. Like we, I actually thought this year maybe we should treat the block each vine by hand. You know, spray them by hand and do that sort of thing because to send a tractor through the block, you you're spraying half into fresh air. You know, and half yeah, into the vine. So so it's, it's almost like it's not it's not great mentally to farm it, but you know it's a really interesting block. We 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 go through, we prune it, we we do one bud removal on the block, and then the next thing we're harvesting grapes off it. And the grapes and the wine is fantastic. So you you just hang in there, you know, and and it just hangs in there. So yeah, I mean, dare I say, when that day comes, um, would you replant it with with Shannon? That block? one hundred percent. Without doubt, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be, you know, uh, it's it's proven. And admittedly, I think part of the greatness in the vineyard comes from the age. I don't know if at a young age it will produce such great wine, but it's proven that if we if we put Shannon in there, and we'll probably go to something like Bushvine Shannon, or we'll try to trellis it the same as the old block or whatever, um, and then and then just hang in there, there and, and hopefully it matures and gives us the same quality. Yeah, yeah. This, I don't know if you've, you've sorted out your phone, but this is a very cool pick. Um, and um, as, as you know, like when I was still trying to pass that BSc degree, much like you back at Stellenbosch, I um, 
probably uh, destroyed some of the wines at Waterford at the time, um, but yeah, generally helping out working at Waterford. So, and the only reason why I bring that up because that's your almost your other next door neighbor on the sort of more towards Stellenbosch. And I just see this picture of this protea and the vineyards and like that part of the, that Blau Cliff, it's just a, it's a special spot. And I mean, I mean, I'm sure you just talk about things like biodiversity there when people come and come and visit. It's like you, you've got special vineyards and then you're surrounded by this amazing, amazing Cape flora and fauna. So, um, yeah, this, this, this picture is very uh, appropriate, you know, for, for where we are. You write the valley itself, like when we have people up here for the first time, it blows their mind. They, they, first of all, they don't, re you know, don't never realize that it was up here because we're so close to Stellenbosch. But, you know, people get as far as Waterford and then they turn around and, you know, they do the chocolate and wine tasting and, and off they go. They don't realize that they can come up to us up here. Um, we always say there is life after Waterford. So if you, you know, if you continue up into that valley, you climb up by about another couple of hundred meters and you get up to where Dave and ourselves are and a couple of other farms up here. And you can see the blocks uh, in the distance behind this protea um, yeah. are these little terraces going up into the mountain, which we plant on. Um, and I, I love that. You know, the, you're dealing with all of these little parcels that are, have different aspects, different terroir. Um, you know, they're surrounded completely by fane balls, not by a neighbor's vineyards or something like that, you know. So, yeah. so you really are out there on the mountainside farming, which is great. No, it, lo it looks amazing. And the other thing was, it, it made me think, because when we visited up on the top there, there's that sort of reservoir. And then I remember you told me some story with, uh, um, it, it was it a, did they used to bottle water on the farm or it was a spring or what, what was the story there? is the story so so part of it dave dave mentioned that he sold a portion of his farm to uh to the previous owners here um Kiermont is made up of two separate farms and and one of the owners of the previous farms he bought it and he found this beautiful spring um and he decided that he was going to bottle spring water so he he built the the what the shed which is currently our winery um yeah. a massive building uh, and 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 started bottling water in it, but he didn't go through all of the zoning correctly, and the neighbors objected to his operation, and they followed a huge fight in the in the in, in the valley, and the neighbors still talk about it. Um, yeah. And eventually, they got the municipality to shut him down, uh, and he oh. was bottling the spring water. I my parents were friends with both parties, and that was awfully oh. awkward. Um, yeah. So eventually, eventually they 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 shut him down, and uh, he decided to sell the farm to Mark. Um, okay. So yeah, so the, the the dam that you've got in, in the picture in front of you there is a little reservoir which is fed by that spring. It's a very strong spring with beautiful quality water. We call it sweet water. It's really you know it's so soft and and beautiful. Um, but now we just use it for the vines. Eh? Now we just irrigate nice. the vines with it. So. So our vines drink spring water only. Yeah, no, that's um, uh, that's very posh. Looked after. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a that's a spe no, it's a special spot there. We had, I remember we had a drink near the at the reservoir. I know yeah. you've had parties with your mates there too, which I don't. Yeah, know my mates, my mates, and they, you know, actually now with kids and everything, things have sort of fizzled out a little bit. But when my mates used to come down from Joburg. They used to say, like, okay, let's just go straight to the reservoir. We pack a cooler box and we go up there and we swim and we and we drink beers and watch the sun go down. I remember a mate of mine coming down from Joburg and we he drove from the airport to the farm. He spent the weekend at the farm with us and his parents live in Cape Town. And he drove back to the airport and flew home again and didn't go and see his parents <laughs> and he, just because he loved it so much on the farm. So, so yeah. it's a special spot. Um I think that um, what do we? I think we were going to maybe chat about uh, before the single vineyards. Was it the Merlot or I, I don't know where where we are now? <laughs> so yeah, so sorry <clears throat> that went down the wrong way. Um, You're right. <clears throat> yeah, you're gonna have to carry on talking for a second. My my wine <laughs> went down the wrong path. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that while well, Alex is gathering his his thoughts yeah. and his. 
there's no Sorry, that went, that went, my, wi- my wife went down the wrong way either either that or we've been doing a lot of trade launches and i've, and I've caught COVID over the last couple of days hopefully <laughs> not um, um yeah dk we we can touch on um on merlo briefly uh the yeah. picture in front of you is is actually an old merlo block which we <clears throat> made some of our first wines out of but we we have subsequently replaced that with a vin- um with a syrup vineyard yeah um so merlo has become quite an important part in, in what we do it actually started by accident more than anything else we had uh, a few barrels of merlo left over after we had blended our other wines together it's always worked well up here it's a really strange thing because <clears throat> you know people in south africa particularly winos don't have a great opinion on sir on, on merlo um but for some reason, it's always worked pretty well up here. You know, some of our first wines were very heavy on the Merlot side, um, and and I still love it. I'm still very proud of it, and I still I still you know fight people on the on the uncoolness of Merlot. Um, so yeah, we 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 produced those first five barrels. We released it into the trade, and it went really well. Um, I think it was about the same time that we started working with Great Domains because a couple of years later, we were sending you guys a lot of murder up to, to Joburg. Um, and I think it's, for me, you know, we've got a couple of sites, which the one is it makes a slightly lighter Merlot and the other one is a little bit more tannic and we use more of that in our state reserve. But we're making it in a very gentle and, and fairly natural style and, and way. We use old barrels and that sort of thing. So the wine ends up being quite a gentle and, and pure fruit expression. Um, and I think that's why it's done quite well uh, in the market. You know, it wasn't something that we that we set out to become now the new, like my UK importer calls me Mr. Merlot. Um, it wasn't, that was never the aim, you know, but it, it worked well. The vineyards are beautiful there. I, I really, I'm very proud of the, the Merlot that we produce, even though it's, probably our cheapest red wine that we do um, and it works well and uh, you know and and we've we've gained a lot of very good customers who have tasted it in restaurants and then come on to to discover our other wines yeah i think the the merlot as you say like it gets a it gets a, a bashing in general um, but but unfairly so just because it it's it's the grape that's used to make some of the greatest wines in the world so it's um if it's made correctly um like th- that the merlot within the kiermont range for me is like just a really solid offering and it's exactly what you say like it's someone that has it and no one's not going to like it and then if they want to seek further from there they can probably notch it up a gear with some of the the single vintage zeros and things like that which is probably what we um need, need to get onto which is the, the top side and the and the steep side yeah. Is, is is Christine saying, okay, move, move along, move along. Uh, so we must keep an eye on, on time and stuff. So yeah, so it's it's good to go on to Surah. Um, Surah was really from the outset, something which I felt had a really, really strong potential here. Um, we obviously, we had Dave Trafford up the road who, who made a lot of, um, a lot of really good Surah before. All the new kids came on the block. He was really renowned for his Syrah and still is. We had uh, Andre van Rensburg down the road who made the first Syrah at, um, at Stellenzicht. Kevin Arnold, who everybody knows, is, uh, you know, they, everybody knows that Syrah. And then the Tambours Club. So it was happening around us. Um, it, it also happened to be a, a variety which I really loved, you know, just from the outset. And um, we made our very first proper Syrah in 2009. Uh, we made it from our Steepside vineyard and the block, I think it was its first or second crop. We made the wine, released the wine, uh, and I fortunately got to present my wines at an early stage to a guy called Neil Martin, who at the time was writing for Robert Parker and Robert Parker's wine advocate. And, you know, I was quite nervous and I showed him the wines and wasn't thinking too much about it. And he ended up scoring the wines really highly. And it was the first time all of a sudden, who's Kiermont? Like, what's going on here? Um, and that, that syrup that we made from, from literally like two-year-old vineyards scored about 94 points. And a 94 points in the, at that stage was yeah. like 96 now, you know, 97. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Now, nowadays, that's 94 is not much. But in those days, it was a lot. 
Oh, that's that. No, but so that that was um, so that was Neil Martin, who's now with obviously with Venice. Has he has he tasted your your latest single vineyard releases yet with the whole COVID thing, or you're not or you're not sure? Yes, yeah. So we we have sent samples uh, to him, but he hasn't compiled his report for South Africa for this year yet. So okay. he's got all the samples for the South African wines, and um, and and hopefully we'll be hearing good news from him soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and then yeah, just to quickly touch on steep side versus top side, the name and and so obviously yeah, yeah. Is all, what's the difference? Yeah. So so there are two vineyards on the farm. Um, they face each other. In fact, this is we're currently looking at top side. Uh, top side is on a, a west facing slope of the farm, and and behind top side is the helderberg and there that's where you find steep side so that's north facing that's facing out towards malmesbury and 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 on, on top side where we're looking at the vineyard right in front of us that's facing out towards cape town or table mountain um so the aspect gives it a slightly cooler um climate it only gets sort of midday to afternoon sun as opposed to steep side which gets morning sun and the and the soils on this on the this vineyard are a lot rockier. You can tell by the rocks in the foreground there, where uh, the soils on steep side are more your clay loam, uh, which is typical of the Helderberg. Um, so for for the first few vintages, we 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 blended all the wine into the Kiermont wine, and then you know we had a, a wonderful vintage in 2012, and I felt like we had such a distinction between the two vineyards. That we should bottle like a barrel of each of them separately and see how how they compare type of thing. So we did that in 2012. It was our first uh, single vineyard release of of the Syrahs, and people were fascinated by this comparison between uh, the two vineyards, same farm, actually the same clone, even uh, very similar vine age. The wines made pretty much the same in the cellar. We're very low. I'm a very lazy winemaker do very little in the cellar um, and matured in the same way you know all 500 liter barrels and the wines are holes apart you know they really are very very different um, and even even tasting the the latest vintage over the last few days it's just been everybody's been amazed at how different they taste so purely purely as a wine geek i wanted to show people that you know what 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 is the difference what is terroir yeah, and I think I think there's a couple of things that are awesome where you so you're releasing those now. It's 2016 as the, yeah. the latest release, which I think always with wine, where you're in that if you're in a position where you can release stuff a bit later when it's a bit more, let's say, ready. Uh, that's one of the sort of obviously you've planned it, but it's one of the privileges where you don't have to rush it to market. The, the stuff's made in very small volumes. It's very precious to you guys, and you can as I say, release it a bit later. That must make a big difference as a winemaker because I know that's the first thing people stress about. My baby's on the market and it's too young and people won't say nice things about it because it's not ready. Um, whereas to have four years, I think, makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it raises a, a good point about our wines. You'll notice if you look through our portfolio, the wines are generally a little bit older. Um, Mark has always appreciated wines which are not babies. Uh, and it's really nice to work for somebody who he watches the cash flow very closely. You mustn't get me wrong. We, we, we run a business which is now fortunately profitable, um, but he's never wanted to sell young wines. Even our very first vintage, we bottled it. I was like a young winemaker, really excited. I want to get this thing out. Let's get a label on it and stuff. And he said, no, put it into bins. And we'll start looking at selling it maybe next year or the following year, you know. And and that was, yeah. I, I should have known at that point. And, and, and subsequently, I've got quite stressed about, you know, stock and why we're on these old vintages and stuff. And he's completely calm about it. And, and, and therefore, I'm calm about it now, you know. And we've taken an approach that we have 150,000 bottles. I don't even know how many bottles we've got. Maybe 200,000 bottles in the store here. It's all maturing beautifully, and we sell it as and when we can, and we make enough wine to to keep that stock going and hopefully grow it a little bit. Actually, yeah. Well, so I mean, even on that note, a, a year older, we're gonna shortly move to the estate red, which will be fifteen. 
It's actually 14. The, the estate Syrah, the Kiermont Syrah is 15, and the estate reserve is 40, 2014. Okay, the estate 14. I mean, that's amazing for, to have that six year that six year thing. And then the other thing is you you didn't say you were so young earlier, but I think I'll still give it to you that you're still part of the young winemaking crowd. And I think the, the one of the hanging, big things hanging on by my claws at the moment, <laughs> yeah. Just, just. But I yeah. mean with yeah. The young winemakers, I think, as a generalization, a lot of them don't own their own pieces of land. And maybe a bits and pieces, but a lot of it's the whole buying in thing, which we understand the logistics and the economics of it. But I think for you, I don't know, I'd, I'd be interested to know, it must be quite empowering to, I don't want to say have your own land, but like to be looking after your own vineyards, be in total control, and you can really sort of plan a long-term vision and i think it must make quite a difference to your psyche but that's my assumption yeah you know um very good friends of mine chris and andrea malinu who have done so well and, and they've now bought their own vineyards for that very own for that very reason um even them you know they would have been working with certain blocks for for a few years and and it was very possible that either somebody comes along and says no i want the whole block and takes it out from under their feet or the farmer decides it's not profitable anymore and decides to pull the vineyard out, mm. or, or he just doesn't do his job properly and doesn't farm or farm it properly or sucker it or whatever. So, so yes, it is it is fantastic to have that security to know what you're looking at um, every year. You know, as far as possible. You know, nature still has the final trump card, but um, you know, to to know that you. Um, the blocks that you're working with, I go for a walk in the evening, I look at all the blocks that we're working with. Uh, I can pop up now and look at where the guys have been suckering today or see how that vineyard's doing uh, after the wind or whatever it was. You know, like you're really in touch with all the vineyards um, and also and also in, you know, relatively in control of what, what you're getting from them and, uh, you know, the yeah. amount of fruit and that sort of thing. No, I think it makes a it makes a big difference, and especially if the the right varieties are in the soil, which, as as we've already discussed, that they 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 are. So I think that makes a difference. Um, so the one that we haven't spoken about, which timing wise probably works quite well, because that would broadly be the one that we'd end off with, um, unless we've got time to talk about the Reserve Fourteen. But is the is the Pondok? Yeah, yeah, Pondok Ruch. So yeah. Pondok Ruch is a um, it's, it's, I always joke with people, I say, no, we designed that specifically for the UK market because they cannot pronounce that name. That's just like, it's impossible. Um, and, and it's lovely watching them try. So, no, it's, uh, it's, it's, the name refers, it's a ridge here above the winery. We're looking at a picture of it. You can see there's a bit more clay in the soil there. It's a little bit lighter. It's a little bit more sort of uh, lighter clay soils. Um, it, as you lead up from the winery up above uh, it, to the top of the farm, it's a, where we went to that reservoir, there's, there's a little yeah. block of cab frank up there, um, very exposed, so the yields are very low, the, the buck is currently eating it every night, so I've got to go up there again tonight, um, but yeah, and, and the grapes that it produces, very low yields, but very, very tight little clusters of, of berries with thick skins, so so the wine ends up being quite an intense wine. Um, we try to pick it, uh, you know, that as 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 ripe as possible. It's a quite a difficult one to get to get the timing right because it's always got lots of acid, lots of really, you know, Cab Franc can have a lot of sort of greenish tannin. Um, and uh, so we we you know picking wise, it's it's a crucial thing to get it right. And we've started now. I think the 16 is the best vintage that we've done so far really it's got an element of freshness but it's also it's it's also got this beautiful bright red fruit in it uh, which i really love about it and and was the plan that it was always going to be on its own in the bottle or no like like the other single vineyards they were it was ending it was going into our state reserve um it's it's sort of become over the years more and more important in our state reserve and i think it's always going to be a very important part of that blend you know, going forward, I'm looking at our next few blends now actually increasing its percentage quite dramatically in the blend. Um, I think it's a lovely variety. It's very well suited here, but it was su super distinctive. 
uh, every time we made it and and particularly the top couple of terraces and so decided then at that point you know we've got to, we've got to highlight this this distinction in this wine um, and decided to do it as a single vineyard we bottled in our first vintage of doing it i think we did 900 bottles it went really well and now we're up to about two two thousand eight hundred bottles or so of, okay. of that okay um, so it's it's more of a vineyard selection than a barrel selection um yeah i would say in this case we i know the lower part of the vineyard is a little bit um sort of lighter fruit with a little bit more red fruit and it suits our estate reserve very well where the upper portion is a little bit more intense and robust and that okay. that goes well into the the, the single uh or, you know the single single variety bottling thing or the single vineyard bottling okay no that's cool well we oh there's the picture that won't be that's cool so is, is space quite tight there or is it was it was is it all sufficient and it works and you're happy no, so we're looking at the the winery now during that's obviously two pictures which are, are merged together yeah, there yeah um uh, it's uh you know we we fortunately we built the winery out of out of an existing large shed and it was quite a big building to start with so we've actually always had enough space you yeah. could always do with more space but but we've got actually a, it's a fantastic facility you know it really it's very simple it's three big rooms that we work in um we work with a forklift to create gravity we don't we don't pump any of the wine around um and so yeah space is not really too much of an issue for us um depending on you know the time of year and storage and how sales are going but uh in general not too too much of an issue okay what's up coming in there oh, there we go yeah so We're not surfing so, actually doing some work yeah no that was just for that picture and then I left <laughs> after that and, and went surfing again. Now, the, the, this is, um, you know, maybe if Christine can maybe go back to the previous picture, I'm not sure if it's possible, but this is how we do our pressing. So uh, Shane is, is tipping the grapes. Shane is, has been with us in the winery here since 2000, since I made my first wines way back then. He's grown with the business and now runs a, a big part of the winery, actually pretty much runs the winery. Uh, and he's wonderful. Uh, He's really my right hand man. Um, and um, <clears throat> he is here tipping the grapes. As you can see, we don't pump anything. So he's tipping the grapes into our basket press. Uh, shortly after this, we'll jump on them and, and squeeze out some juice. And then that'll go into the press and, and down into the barrels and then eventually start fermenting. So it's just a nice, I, I love that picture. I think it's really apt. And the next one is, uh, the, the next one I love very much less of me doing a punch mm. down. So all of all of the uh, all of the wines, the red wines get about one punch down a day. It's all wild yeast ferment, so so you know I don't like to over extract. So we do we do a very gentle punch down in the morning, check the temperatures and everything, and then if the if the 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 tank needs another punch down in the evening, I'll do it one later on the in the the, the evening. Yeah, that's the. Oh, there we go, and that's the, and that's that terrible view to taste Kiermont for those for those that do want to visit and should be visiting and um, yeah, yeah, tasting yeah, through the 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 special tasting place. Room, yeah, the the tasting room has become a very important thing to us. Um, we never really set out to be a very uh, popular tasting location, but we've seen the value in in people connecting with the brand and coming and tasting wines and and seeing the place and seeing. Oh wow! And you know, getting the story and maybe being shown a, a Puffader or a uh, or a Jack Russell or, or both at the same time, or you know, um, and uh, it's it's really like people come down from Joburg now. They've bought the wine from you, and they come down here and they can they can connect with the place, and then they hopefully go home and, and buy a bunch more wine. Yeah, no, it's it's very cool. Well. It I um as I started with uh, let's say an hour ago we we waiting for the arrival of the new releases which as I say the whole team is very excited for and uh, we know the wines are going to be cracking and um that's uh, that's almost the time up basically so we've got to try and stick to the hour where before people go and do their cooking and all these things so um I hope I know I don't know when you're going to next be up here. We'll probably see you down there before you up here. I'm not sure, but um, 
yeah, congrats again, Alex. You you carving out a, a proper quality niche in the valley, and uh, yeah, just carry on now. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Derek. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks for putting this together this evening, and to Christine and your team. Um, and thank you for your support up there in Joburg. It's it's been a wonderful few years working with you guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm keen to come up to Joburg again. You know, this whole COVID thing is so un you know uncertain. But uh, maybe maybe worthwhile. We should chat maybe about coming up to show you guys the single vineyards or something like that. Yeah, it sounds like sounds like a plan. So we'll organise it. And yeah, thanks for your time and thanks everyone for for joining. Been following the chat a bit. Sally and Tabo, thanks for for joining. Simon, all the way in the UK, thanks for joining. Um, good to have you all here. And um, yeah, we'll see you all again soon. Alex, thanks. And make sure Milo's not killing any more chickens. And uh, go check on the suckering. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, thanks, DK. Thanks, ciao, man. man. Ciao, ciao.